all of us who work with instruments have an inherent love affair with wood. We talk about wood, we look at trees, we go to wood yards, we slice wood open, we smooth it, we polish it, we, we do, we're just, it's really become, it's almost a religion, it's almost an obsession. And so this obsession and this, this, this wonderful admiration for this miraculous substance um, is at the core of everything we do. Certainly the voice of wooden string instruments is related completely to the materials that you use. And if you're using um, the tree, the wood, for various parts, each part of the instrument is made of a different kind of wood, specifically for a different reason, because of the way it, because of the voice that it has or the way that it functions. So this has a beech scroll, maple neck, willow on the back and sides, and a spruce top. And the fingerboard is always um, ebony. I do, I am afraid that I am guilty of looking at trees as not slabs of meat, but you'd say lumber. It's a beautiful piece of wood. I'm not sure I'll use it because it's so nice, but I probably will someday use it. I honor and treasure trees as they grow, and I can't help but imagine what a tree would look like cut into lumber and used for either a piece of furniture, if that's appropriate, or a musical instrument, if that's appropriate, because obviously every tree is not appropriate. But for now, it's just a great thing to look at and admire the beauty of the nature. I mean, who would ever come up, come with up with this as a surface for a tree? There are inherent things about each instrument that are part of the, uh, of the instrument that have to do with the wood, the nature of the wood, um, how the tree grew, where it grew, um, whether it was fast growing or slow growing, um, whether it was uh, cut in the winter or cut in the summer. All of these things are very, very important in terms of leading up to that event where you have the ideal conditions to create a really first-class instrument. <laughs> This particular maple, very, very fine grain. You know, if you count the, the rings, that's probably 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. There's 125 years just right there in that much wood. It's a very slow growing tree. Um, you know, this spruce tree is, is a, little, a little faster growing and wouldn't have to be that old or that big. Now for a cello, it does have to, it's a bigger piece of wood, so it's gonna have to grow longer. And the maple can be quite um, showy with, the, with all the figure and all these waving um, grain. It's a piece of flame maple, just the same as we have on the, on the back of the violin. But when I split it, you can see the actual fibers. You can actually see the fibers curving, like just as you would in curly hair. And some trees have this um, grain pattern and some don't. So and w when it's moved in the light, it shimmers back and forth. So because the, the fibers are actually actually turning. The top of the instrument is uh, is sort of the business part of the instrument. It's the it's what it's where the strings sit, it's what gets activated. It's really the prime activator of the air volume inside. Um, whereas the back and the sides are, are, are as important, but perform more of a supporting role. This little groove around the edge is called the channel, or the, uh, or the, I guess it's just in English, it's called the channel. And the arching curves around the back of the instrument, and it, and it reverses curve into this little channel. The whole essence of Baroque design is about the reversing curve. The outside of the instrument curves around and reverses. The, the arching curves down and reverses. The, the sound holes make that classic kind of S or F pattern, and that's a reverse curve. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a very important part of, of Baroque design. And once the, this little inlay slip strip is, uh, is put in called the purfling, which reinforces and decorates the edge, Then I, I create this little channel around the edge, 
which is the final bottom of the arch. And then I'll make the connection between the rounded arch here and the, and the scooped out part here. The next step would be to come in with a, a small little curved plane, which is a curved bottom, and come down into, the, into that channel. kind of has two purposes. One is very simply to hold the pegs in place, the scroll and the peg box together, um, hold the pegs in place. But the scroll was just a way of finishing a line and, this, and the neck is basically a line which comes out from the body and you have to finish it in some way. And again we're back to the Baroque design. Things in nature curve that way. Uh, you know, mountains come down and valleys curve up. So, and, and in the human body, just look at the human body. Everything about the way the human body is shaped, if you're a sculptor of, of the human form, it's always a form comes out and a form goes in. But the scroll, and this needs to be strong to hold the pegs, it needs to be strong for the neck. And visually, the maple's a little nicer to look at, so that it's, um, this is also maple. The sides of the instrument are thin slices of wood, and they're bent, they're bent around a form which gives you the main shape. The temperature of this iron is about like a frying pan. It's just enough so that the water dances off the top. So it's simply put on the iron, And then I bring it around, and as it heats up, the wood bends. So it, it kind of mimics the, the curve of the various curves on different surfaces here. And I just hold it against the iron, just like your iron a pair of pants. And as I pull it off, I, I bend it into shape as it, as, it, as it becomes plastic, as it's heated. And this would be the shape that might, that might go into this part, part of the violin here. You know, when you're working with a piece of wood, when you bang on a piece of wood, when you, when you bend a piece of wood, you feel you gain a certain sensitivity to how each piece of wood functions. Just work, when you're working with the wood, and the sound of the wood, you know, you're just, you can just, you can hear the nature of the wood as you, as you work with it in your hands. You get to appreciate the structure of the wood, you get to appreciate the anatomy of the wood, and when you pick up a piece of wood, and it, you know, you thump on it, and you, you hear, kind of hear how it rings. These, these are some of the most sensitive and, and telling, you know, scientific instruments, and the ear, and the eyes. So I love just even flattening a piece of wood. You know, I just learn, I get a sense of what this wood is about. I used to have a friend that he used to, he used to chew on it. He said, oh, I like the, mmm, mm, let's see what it tastes like. For me, you know, I don't need to taste the wood. After 40 years, I still find it amazing that this raw, growing, organic thing in the forest turns into something so refined and, and controlled, and then with a function that's so specific, and all because we have the tree. Trees do have all kinds of purposes, but when, when I get a chance to interact with one in a more intimate way, um, it it's really, it's a privilege and also it's a wonderful experience.